and she is a very prol prolific and creative in all of these fields. Professor Salma Haddad has a strong academic career and many scholarly publications in translation, translation theory, and cultural studies. Following her PhD in translation at, uh, from Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh uh, in the UK. She has been working on three English Arabic specialized dictionaries focusing on the cultural dimension of language and highlighting connotative meanings. The trilogy aims to bridge the gap between cultures, facilitate communication, and reduce misunderstanding. And the title of the, uh, the uh, uh, dictionary she's, been, uh, she's working on, and it's not out yet, Sulam al Jamal and the Arab Baina Malahat al Ghuzlan wa al Qurud. Salma has given talks on numerous occasions in the UAE, in Syria, in the United States. She has also won many national and international awards. Salma is with us uh, today as a creative writer, as a poet, and in particular as a storyteller, considering the context of our conference. So I'm going to start asking um, Salma some questions. And uh, please feel free to, like, kind of, if you feel you want to follow up and, and uh, ask her questions, just be at ease. That's fine. And I'm not going to talk about her uh, stories, because she's going to be responding and talking about them in more depth in response to my questions. So I'll start the questions. Dr. Salma, thank, thank you very much for being morning, here. Good morning to you. Kind introduction. Thank, thank you. you all for coming. Yes. So uh, I'll probably begin by asking you to talk about how, considering I already uh, uh, I took it upon myself to define you as this multi uh, uh, person in one. So how do you see yourself? How do you define yourself? And who comes first in you as, as you see yourself? Is it the poet? Is it the novelist? Is it the lexographer? Please. Yeah, well, I actually started writing poetry uh, when I was uh, 10 years old. And uh, at that time, I was one of on the Arabic one uh, with only one, uh, uh, one linguistic vision and one uh, poetic vision as well. And um, then I started to write some um, short plays. And I had a strong passion for this, but then for no reasons I stopped. And I didn't have any passion for this anymore. And then um, I started writing uh, English poetry. Um, I just started to mix all these poetic visions um, uh, between Arabic and English. And, uh, to do something very special that is not related to Arabic, not related to English. <coughs> um, then I started thinking about writing novels. And uh, this took me a long time, actually. I don't know why. Um, the idea persistently came to me. And uh, it was always there in my mind. I don't know why I resisted this idea. Maybe because I was very proud of my role as a poet. Maybe. Maybe because I was skeptical about my narrative uh, pen. So I just tried to postpone it. The idea pushed me, pushed me, and then I couldn't resist it. And uh, the whole idea came to me with all the characters, with all the themes, and everything. So I couldn't resist it anymore. So I put pen to paper and started to write my first novel. Um, of course, the dictionary compiling came to me after getting my PhD. And as a researcher in the fields of cultural studies and translation, translation theory, social linguistics, and all the rest of this, I think that um, this area of cultural dictionaries is overlooked by, uh, uh, by researchers. So I said to myself, I'll do this myself. And I will uh, <coughs> to concentrate on the connotations, uh, cultural connotations, rather than um, the actual meaning of words, the denotative meaning of words. Um, uh, this, um, well, these dictionaries are not going to be useful to the layman of the street, of course. Uh, these are going to be very useful for researchers in the fields of comparative studies, <coughs> in, uh, the field of translation theory, social linguistics, cultural studies, uh, uh, analytical studies, all the rest of this. So they are going to be uh, useful for them. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, it's a very slow movement. Uh, it's due to the fact that I'm working on all this 
on my own, say. And uh, this project should have been taken by, uh, by a team, of course. So uh, I'm very optimistic about this. I'm not going to stop working on this because it's my passion here. But uh, at the same time, it's going to be sluggish, I think. Well, I wish you all, uh, all the luck. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank I really you. need it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I read your, your poetry. And I'm a big fan of your your poetry. It's very philosophic and very reflective. So, but I also love your um, your novels, mm -hmm. the two you. that came out already, and the one that I'm looking forward to read it because mm -hmm. you, um, I'm sure uh, readers will will uh, uh, agree with me once they read you. Um, you are a very strong uh, narrator, so I'll let you talk to us about your narrative technique. Yeah, um, well, um, I think um, I am very much interested in the details. Um, when you, um, of course, um, uh, kind of uh, engaging details, uh, when you immerse your reader with all these immersive, uh, uh, engaging details, uh, the reader, you are inviting the reader to your text as an insider rather than an outsider. So I'm just going to read some of these uh, points and I'm going to give you some examples of some paragraphs about all these details just to understand the idea of um, these um, pragmatic, I can say, functional details. So uh, I think the functional engaging details play a major role in this. When we write a story, we are creating a new world, a world that is a blend of reality and imagination. But this world must look realistic, logical, and coherent. The details connect the story to everyday life of the reader who imagines himself there through characters. In my novels, there are hundreds of details that immerse the reader in the character's experiences. Through these details, the reader sees what the characters see, smells what they smell, taste what they eat, and feel what they feel. Let me read an example of these details. This is taken from uh, my first novel, uh, Sukaina ibn al-Natur. that <coughs> Sukaina I'm sorry, I'm going to read this in Arabic, and I know most of you speak Arabic. استيقظت سكينة على صوت ارتطام السكين بخشبة التقطيع مرورا بمخلل اللفت الأحمر الذي كانت أم مرزوق تحش به السندويشات إضافة إلى أقراص الفلافل والطحينة المخفوقة مع اللبن والليمون والقليل من البقدونس المفروم ورشة من السماق الأحمر. كانت رائحة زيت القل المستخدم عشرات المرات تغلف المكان بوحشية اقتحامية فالمطبخ والذي يستخدم في أوقات الفراغ للاستحمام يطل من الخلف عبر نافذة صغيرة على أرض غير منشأة ويفصله من الأمام عن الغرفة التي تشغلها عائلة أبي جاسم للنوم والدراسة والأكل والجلوس ومشاهدة التلفاز فتحة معدة بالأصل لباب خشبي لم تكتب له الحياة أصلا Four senses are involved in this short descriptive paragraph The reader is invited One To hear the noise of the knife on the chopping board Two See all the details of the food and the house Three Taste the falafel sandwiches with pickles, tahina, yogurt, lemon, parsley, and sumac. And four, smell the oil that has been heated many times. Sumatat um marzuq li lahadat. Sumatawajjahat musri'atan ila al-ghurfa, haythu tulqi sukayna bi raksiha al-mut'ab ala misnadin qitni. Yahtaj li khabiri alwanin yabani. كي يفك طلاسم لونه الأصلي فهو مزيج من الأحمر العنابي والأصفر البرتقالي ودرجات الأخضر الفستقي والزيتوني مرورا بالعشبي فضلا عن بقع متفرقة تشي بمرور قلم حبر من هنا وسندويشة فلافل من هناك 
وعروسة زيت زعتر بينهما. So all these details help the reader to be insider rather than outsider. He knows everything about Sukaina's family, even the dirty colors of the pillow they have. However, this takes a lot of sweat. Without carefully choosing the right descriptive details and balancing them by an overall guiding structure, the text will boringly balloon. The good writer should be three in one. The writer, when he puts down the novel in a certain order. The character, when he feels what the character feels and produ produces real flesh and blood. And the reader, when he expects what the reader is waiting for. So these are the details I am engaged in and I am engaging my reader in just to make him feel free to visit uh, the environment I'm talking about and to feel an insider in this environment. I agree with you because when I, when I took your first novel, I really couldn't uh, put it down. I read it in just one breath. Yeah, thank you. So I, I agree with you. You yeah. do engage the reader in a very, very strong way. Um, you have written, as I just mentioned, the three novels. The one is just coming out. And uh, my question to you um, is whether these you you, th you you intend to have like some continuity in this, <coughs> whether each novel is like a different uh, text uh, on its own uh, and in relation to uh, our conference which is on storytelling travel writing and um, I kind of wonder whether uh, the theme of travel uh, is one of these connecting kind of aspects in the novels <coughs> do you see that um, well, yeah, of course, the three novels are connected through many aspects, including each other. So um, I'm, I'm just going to give you a brief idea about these novels, just to see how connected they are and how they connect, how connected they are to uh, the theme of the conference. Thank you. Um, the protagonists in the three novels are struggling women. In Sukaina ibn Tunnatur. Sukaina is subject to physical, verbal, and psychological violence in a domestic setting. In a male-dominated environment, the abusers, her father and stepbrother, want her to conform to their norms without questioning them. They see her revolutionary, ambitious character as a threat to their authority because it will ultimately empower her and disempower them. They believe that she will one day bring dishonor to the family and that they have the right to wage preventive war on her. They choose to discipline her physically by frequently beating her up in an extremely violent way, verbally by using abusive language with her, name calling, just they always call her al-Baqara, al-Baghla, ila akhirihi and psychologically by systematically threatening her of blocking her access to education and employment, restricting her self-determination, and limiting her personal freedom. In a society which outlaws domestic violence, neither Sukaina nor her mother dares to report being abused for fear of further punishment. In the middle of all this violence, Sukaina has to hang on to her dreams through creating life boy techniques. She finds safe haven in reading Greek mythology and merging it with her dreams to form a single reassuring entity. An entity that situates her in a wider context where she can face challenges and plan for a better future with a relatively clear mind. Her total rejection of what she sees as the stigma of her life and her desperate attempt, attempts to dissociate herself from it drives her to narrate the details of her miserable life using the she point of view because she doesn't feel comfortable with who she is. When she restores the right to self-determination after a long struggle, <coughs> she switches to the eye and expects her audience to switch 
from being sympathetic to admiring. In this novel, women are viewed mainly as product, product, sorry, productive wombs. Failure to give birth to babies is not tolerated by a society which highly appreciates kids, especially boys, and considers them part and parcel of the marriage <coughs> package. Woman's awareness of this intense pressure puts her, woman's awareness of this intense pressure puts her on the defensive and degrades her to a position of weakness, guilt, and inferiority. The character of the university student's stepbrother, who gives himself the absolute authority to physically discipline his sisters and occasionally his stepmother, raises doubts about the ability of university education to challenge and modify the ideological system of some stereotypes who decide to let knowledge peacefully sleep inside books. Sukaina, the protagonist, spiritually travels to Greece as a life boy technique. She finds safe haven in reading Greek mythology and merging it with her dreams to form a single reassuring entity, an entity that situates her in a wider context where she can face challenges, dissociate herself from the stigma of her life. In Sa'ashra Bukahwati Fil Barazil, and this is the second novel I wrote a couple of years ago, the protagonist Leila feels more emotionally secure with her father who warmly and leniently responds to her needs and doesn't set limits to her actions <coughs> and dreams. On the other hand, she hates her punitive mother who adopts disciplinary behavior because she believes that her father <coughs> is too lenient and tolerant to raise her, to raise her appropriately. She keeps calling her <coughs> idiot, speaks about her father in an offens offensively patronizing manner, tries to confiscate her self-determination and places restrictions on her actions and dreams. The totally different parenting styles create a growing gap between Layla and her mother, whose relationship dramatically deteriorates after the death of her father. However, Layla starts later on to put this relationship on a better track by reassessing it and finding reasonable objective justifications for her mother's aggressiveness. In addition to her battle with her mother, Layla has another lengthy draining battle. She strongly believes that love defeats money and revenge. However, she loses her appetite for love and accepts full control of brain when she finds out that her lover's equation is to defeat love by money and revenge. Under the leadership of her brain, Layla starts to see life differently. Layla is the daughter of Syrian expats who live in Sao Paulo and hold Brazilian passport. Pedro, her Sao Paulo childhood friend and future love, is the son of a Syrian father and Brazilian <coughs> mother. Her childhood in Sao Paulo influenced her Syrian identity and obviously concealed her Syrian culture. When her parents take her back to Damascus, Layla feels homesick, uprooted, and disconnected from the surroundings. Since she doesn't see the Syrian culture as her own, she <coughs> suffers what is called a reverse culture shock, or own culture shock. There is cultural confusion and a question of belonging. The presence of her father Pedro and her nanny in her Damascus life is the only helping factor in adjusting to, but not integrating into the culture where she managed to develop routine. The premature death of her father and the consequent death of her nanny uh, sorry, Nanny, and the sudden departure of Pedro brings Leila back to square one, where she has another attack of reverse culture shock manifested in mood swings 
withdrawal, anger, and boredom. She starts to recreate the idealized version of Sao Paulo and her childhood there. Her unhealthy, contentious relationship with her mother <coughs> slows down her readjustment process after the second shock and drives her to isolate herself from an environment she comes to perceive as hostile or at best unfriendly. Taking the position of the rejecter, the only way out for her is to leave Damascus, her host culture, and return to Sao Paulo, her original culture, to study dentistry there. <coughs> but Pedro is no longer the innocent, caring child he used to be and she used to know. Years have taught him to weigh options in a businessman's balanced scale and to make unilateral, unemotional decisions. The scales fall from her eyes and she starts to see the exact sizes and colors in life. Obviously, her extreme disappointment in Pedro and the loss of their baby shredded the picture and damaged the relationship between her and Brazil as an original country. As she is an untidy mixture of different cul cultures, Leila starts to see Brazil as her passport country, but she is still not categorizing herself as Syrian. Sao Paulo is the graveyard of her heart and baby, and Damascus is the graveyard of her father and nanny. The cold heat relationship reflects her unpleasant movement between the two cultures and her confusion about her real cultural identity. <coughs> and uh, here's a small paragraph about this kind of cold heat relationship. It's a kind of dream she, uh, she saw about her father after <coughs> من حلم تمنيت لو خسرت كاس كوينتي بفرعيه ومجوهرات أمي وعشر سنوات من عمري ولم يكن حلما مددت يدي الباردة إلى يسار السرير حيث كان يجلس أبي للتو فأحسسته ما يزال دافئا بحبه لكنه فارغ يا إلهي أكاد أموت من شدة البرد أين ذهبت يا أبي نظرت نحو النافذة فرأيت الستائر تتراقص على أنغام عاصفة ربيعية هوجاء ورأيت زهور المشمش تتناثر بعبثية في الهواء يا خسارة لابد وأن روحه غادرت عبر النافذة المفتوحة لتلتحق بأزهار المشمش الحمقاء ليتني أقفلتها قبل أن أنام ليتني أقفلتها قبل أن أنام نهضت لإقفالها وأنا أرتجف من البرد ثم عدت مسرعة لأنتزع الغطاء وأندس تحته باحثة عن رائحة جل أبي من جديد فما وجدتها ربما التحقت هي الأخرى برائحة المشمش في أحضان الفراغ شعرت بفضاء كبير يسبح في داخلي وبرد قارس يقدم أطرافي وجوع شديد لوجبة حب أبوية ساخنة ليلى finally decides to create a temporary middle zone a third culture her own blend of Sao Paulo and Damascus and makes Damascus her final destination where she later adjusts to Syria as a home culture In Akmilini Ya Naila, my third novel, motherhood is woman's major role. Gail's world is full of dolls, dolls to take care of, to feed, to give bath to, to talk to, to shout at, to instruct, to teach, etc. This heavy presence of dolls in their daily life lays the cornerstone for their forthcoming major role, being mummies in a society where having kids is highly appreciated and socially cherished. They grow up with this dream that balloons by time. By the time they reach what is culturally perceived as the prime age range of marriage, they have a full comprehension of the related social values 
and attitudes, cultures, <coughs> ideologies, and shared assumptions. Nothing mirrors all this better than proverbs and social cliches that directly and indirectly. One, encourage, encourage the full package of getting married and having children. This figuratively means that those who have children do not die, and those who don't do. Two, look pejoratively at spinsters and spinsterhood. The adjective ba'ira itself is an extremely offensive word which refers to the spinster as an unwanted commodity or unproductive land. Three, frighten them of the consequences of being alone. ضل راجل ولا ضل حيطة عريس من عود خير من عود With all these cultural assumptions in mind, girls start to look at marriage as their first and most important target in life. To some, it unfortunately becomes the only target. When any dream becomes that swollen and that important to someone's life, <coughs> the disappointment of not fulfilling it turns catastrophic. According to Naila, spinsters go through three main stages. The stage of the usual age of marriage, according to cultural norms, the pre-spinsterhood stage, and the spinsterhood stage. The first is the dynamic era, where time moves relatively smoothly between the stage of the usual age of marriage and pre-spinsterhood. During this period, the social attitude is neutral and women's roles are specific and socially different. There is a relatively friendly relationship between society and women based on full knowledge and respect of each other's duties and rights. In a pre spinsterhood stage, the relationship between women and society starts to take an ambiguous turn. It's the stage of a far less neutral attitude. The woman starts to get worried and confused. And the society starts to interfere both directly and indirectly to put pressure on him <coughs> to accelerate her search for a husband before she enters the following final stage. The race begins and any man is better than remaining unmarried. <coughs> the word sitting down in Oud in this proverb very accurately describe the way society sees the spinster as a paralyzed creature. The focus here is on immobility. However, the pre-spinsterhood stage is still a dynamic era where the unmarried woman weighs her option and chooses to achieve her target, even at the expense of her emotions and the picture she has drawn for the future life. In the spinsterhood stage, the woman passed the common age of marriage. The relationship between women and society <coughs> becomes more hostile, and the era takes a static form. The woman is socially classified as spinster. Status confirmed. She feels that she is undesirable and unwanted by the other sex and starts to wonder why. Any answer to her why will bring her more depression and more disappointment. At the social lo level, she is stereotyped as unattractive, pathetic, aggressive, and complicated. No matter what she does to change this stereotyped image, it remains unchanged. So here, uh, Naila is talking about this. ينجح المجتمع في وضع الفتاة تحت ضغط نفسي هائل 
يحدد سن حين يحدد سن الزواج وسن القلق وسن فوات الاوان وتكمن المرحله الاخطر بين سن القلق وسن فوات الاوان حيث تبدا الفتاه باعداد نفسها لتقديم تنازلات جوهريه واحده تلو الاخرى للالتحاق باي ثمن باخر مقطوره من قطار الزواج الذي ربما يغافلها ويدهسها في نهايه المطاف اما من بقيت على الرصيف ومرت بها جميع المقطورات باشكالها والوانها دون ان تعيرها اهتماما فتحظى باكبر قدر من التنميط فهي المعقده العدوانيه الحاسده الغاضبه الناقمه القبيحه قليله الحظ الى اخره من الصفات التي يجنها بها المجتمع ويصنع منها حاله بامتياز العانس حاله تستحق شفقه المجتمع مسكينه ما اجاها النصيب مسكينه سوري سوري العانس حالة تستحق شفقة المجتمع مسكينة ما اجاها النصيب مسكينة انكسر خاطرها لم يكن رفضي للزواج بعد تجربتي الفاشلة مع حسام استمرارا لتعلق به وديمومة لحبي له كل ما في الامر انني اقدس الحب ولا اؤمن بثنائية لا يكون الحب ثالثا لا اؤمن بجسدين لا تكون الروح ثالثهما لا اؤمن بحتميه الثنائيه ولا بحتميه الامومه ما لم تتوافر الشروط المناسبه ولا اؤمن بكارثيه الوحده ولا اعتبرها بعبعا في اسوا حالاتها فكيف سيف فكيف ساقنع مجتمعا يؤمن حتى نقي العظام بحتميه الزواج وحتميه الامومه وكارثية الوحدة أنني لست معقدة ولست عدوانية ولست حاسدة لأحد ولست مسكينة ولست مكسورة الخاطر كيف سأقنعهم أنني أنا لست هم كيف This is the monologue of uh, of uh, Naila throughout the Would you be able to translate a little bit because it's very interesting Um, it, the whole, all the ideas are already the mentioned. Ideas. Oh, all okay. the ideas okay. are already okay. mentioned in the explanation before. So talking the about the spinster. It's really very powerful when you said, كيف أقنعهم أنني لستهم أنني أنا. Simply, yeah. Yeah. you're struggling just to be yourself. Exactly. It takes you ages to struggle yeah. to just to prove that you are yourself, not anybody else. At the family level, her duties are multiplied. <laughs> Since she is considered responsibility free due to the absence of husband and children in her life. And everybody, everybody says, Naila ma anda shi. Naila ma wara ha shi. Tlubu min Naila. Kulu la Naila. Naila btaamri. Naila btsawi. Naila. Naila because she's not married. She is, her, her time is public property. Her time is public property. In a society that does not appreciate independent accommodation for spinsters, the unmarried woman, uh, by the way, I very much hate the word spinster, but I'm just using, a, uh, using it for the sake of the it's public. A it's a horrible, <laughs> horrible word. And it's very <laughs> pejorative, a very passive word, but I'm just using it for the sake of the context, both in English and in Arabic. Of course. لا لسا انا بالعربي بدي اقول لك بايره يعني مصطلحات اخرى مور فايلنت مور فايلنت ان ا سوسايتي ذات دازنت ابريشيت اندبندنت اكوموديشن فور سبيسترز ذا ان ماريد وومن از ليفت ويز اوت اولموست ويز اولموست وان تشوز ليفينغ فور ذا ريست اوف هير لايف ان ذا هاوس اوف ذا فاميلي ان اديشن تو كومبليت لوس اوف بريفسي ذس انتيز extra responsibilities for three generations so she has responsibilities towards three generations parents and their permanent or temporary guests 
visiting sisters and brothers and their kids. So she has responsibilities for all these children. While some spinsters accept to stay in the corner they are pushed into by the ideological system of their society, others fight for their right to be who they are and nobody else. Naila's main antagonist is the way society stereotypes here as a completed angry spinster who has all the free time of the world to save everybody around her. Her time is viewed as a collective property. But she is not a stereotypical spinster character. She sees herself as a butterfly that has every right to protect her wings in all possible means. Her conflict is intra <coughs> At the age of 40, she's face to face with an ideological system within her own culture which had confined <coughs> her to one major role, wife and mother, and started to offensively stereotype her when she failed to play this socially expected role. She dissociates herself from the stereotype imposed on her by her own culture and tries to reculture it according to how she sees and feels it, not according to the norms of the society she lives in. He says, <coughs> أريد أن أجلس مع نفسي على فنجان نسكافيه أتناقش معها حول الكثير الكثير من الأمور أعيد معها صوغ الكثير الكثير من المشاعر والأفكار دخلت أنا ونفسي الغرفة وأغلقنا الباب خلفنا بهدوء جلسنا على الأريكة ووضعت وراء نفسي وسادة طرية وردية اللون كي تسترخي ثم خلعت حذائي ورفعت قدمي الصغيرتين على عارضة الطاولة الحديدية أمامنا كي أسترخي وبدأنا نشرب قهوتنا فكرة فكرة لقد اختتمت زيارة حسام لي مرحلة عصور الظلام التي عشتها دامسة لأكثر من عقديه من الزمن ومهدت الطريق أمامي لمرحلة عصر النهضة نهضتي من ثقل الثنائية الجاثم على صدري لمجرد أنه مطلب اجتماعي نهضتي من مفاهيم اجتماعية ضغطتني باتجاهات ربما لم تكن يوما جزءا من معماري الفكري نهضتي من غضب طال أمده حتى كاد يودي بسكينتي إلى الأبد يجب أن أدافع عن كل ما أؤمن به وأن أعيد ترتيب بيتي الداخلي لأعيش فيه مع نفسي بالرفاه لا بالبني أرفض أن أكون عبدة لمنظومة اجتماعية لا أتقاسم معها ألف باء هندسة الفكر Travel is seen in different ways by my protagonists, <coughs> namely Sukaina and Leila. While Sukaina views spiritual travel to Greece and physical travel to France as an escape from physical, mental, and spiritual confinement and control, Leila's relationship with the place is controversial and complicated. She is not quite sure about where she wants to be and who she is, where she is. Her cultural identity is determined by the presence, absence of certain persons in her life. The physical or the emotional disappearance of these persons influences her feeling of belonging. So for uh, Sukaina, travel was kind of solution, while uh, for uh, uh, Leila, um, uh, travel was kind of problem because she didn't know where she is and what she wants to be. Uh, is she Syrian? Is she Brazilian? She's, she doesn't feel comfortable there. She doesn't feel comfortable here. And all the time, she wants to be there on the other side. When she's in Brazil, she wants to go back to Damascus. When she's <coughs> in Damascus, she wants to come back to Sao Paulo. So she's culturally confused. So trouble for her is not a solution. It's kind of a problem. 
And uh, you asked me about uh, myself as a traveler. So um, I'd say, to me, travel is mobility. It's a journey outside the I and the we who are supposed to share with me similar cultural aspects. But it doesn't only mean moving between distant geographical locations. There is a big difference between a simple tourist, tourist and a world discoverer who gathers information, gets to know other cultures, <coughs> takes time to build new social relationships, and more importantly, gets to know more about himself <coughs> through knowing the other. As a writer, I strongly believe that when I occasionally disconnect from my daily routines, I become more productive and more focused. Moreover, the chance to visit different countries with different languages, traditions, cuisines, lifestyles, etc., enriches my literary and cultural reservoir and improves the quality of my work by giving me new ideas to deal with and new colors to paint my characters with. It expands my understanding of the world around me. Thank you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to reading Naila's journey to the south. Yeah, it's so already out. I have not not copies because I haven't received a copy from Beirut. It's out only a few days ago, and I haven't received the uh, okay. copies. Yeah. Uh, but, but I can also, also see a type of a genre continuum, because I can see the poetic mm -hmm. style in, uh, in your writing. <coughs> uh, but I have a small question. <coughs> uh, even though I hate classifications, mm -hmm. but uh, do you call yourself a transnational writer? Uh, can you speak about this? You as a diasporic writer, but now in the Arab world, does this uh, affect your way of writing and of your way of seeing space, for example? You didn't tell us about uh, the setting in uh, the first one. Sukaina ibn Tanatur. Sukaina is between Paris and Damascus. Okay. It takes place between Paris and Damascus. Uh, and then uh, uh, Syria <coughs> and Brazil. And, uh, and the last one, Damascus. Only. Damascus. Yeah. So, I mean, this transnational then space, in a way. Well, <coughs> it, I don't know, uh, because, you know, uh, when you are a person as, uh, uh, as uh, Nawar calls me with different hats, uh, they all uh, come into play, okay? Uh, when you are writing a novel, you're not only a novelist, you are a poet, you are a traveler, you are um, a linguist, you are um, a, transition, a transition theorist, you are um, all of them together. So you can't stop, you can't uh, draw a definite line between um, what you are and who you are and what you are talking about in, in your novels. So. Uh, yeah. I can't answer your question, <laughs> honestly, with uh, Just one word, sorry. I mean, yeah. um, what I find great here is the spirit of dissent in your uh, writing, so that writing really becomes an act of resistance. And it's mm -hmm. not only victimizing women that would have really been a hateful act, but yeah. I can see that you provide us with uh, the spirit yeah, of... Yeah, of course, uh, I'm, I'm always dissent. against victimizing women. Yeah. And I'm always against... Uh, <laughs> Women who who um, view themselves as victimized, mm -hmm. yeah, they have to just to stand up. Any time they fall down, they have to stand up again and just to face everything around them and to find other solutions. Mm -hmm. Women are not only wounds for producing babies. Women are not only wives. Mm -hmm. They are they have great roles in society. If they don't get married, they have other choices in life. And uh, this is how they have to see themselves, and this is the, how they have to interact with society on this basis. Otherwise, uh, they will get destroyed. Mm -hmm. if, if nobody has a question, maybe you can end it by uh, Salma just uh, I uh, comment. Oh, okay. yeah, of course. Um, I'm curious about the theme of your uh, next novel because it seems like there is um, sort of like a rep not, not a repetitive, but there is like a thread that uh, is Connect. connects your novels like through the resistance, the stereotyping of society of women. So what would be, and how would the trouble play a role in your next story, like your next novel? Um, you mean the one I haven't... Like the one you're publishing now. Like uh, you said there is one coming out? Yeah, there's one. Um, it's already it's out. Already, yeah. it's, oh, it's already out, but I don't yeah. have the copies because ah, it yeah. came out just a couple of days before Marat Shah al Kitab, so they couldn't bring it. Usually they ship them just two months Fantastic. before, before yeah. the start of the fair. Thank you. Thank you.
So, uh, so what was your question uh, exactly? Uh, no, uh, uh, I was uh, wondering about the theme of the next novel that you said it's already under, but the, whether it can also be the same like uh, theme about women resisting the stereotyping and... Uh, yeah, it's about, uh, it's about Naila who's... Uh, Na yeah, it's about Naila who's stereotyped as <coughs> prisoner. Okay. And, uh, Everybody looks at her as uh, mm -hmm. pathetic, and uh, but they are stereotyping her, but yes. she's not that stereotype, and she's trying to make everyone understand that, look, I am myself, I'm not, I can't be stereotyped the way you are stereotyped. Me. So she's uh, defending herself all the way through, and uh, there's, there's a surprise at the end uh, of, uh, of the novel uh, in answer to our colleagues. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a question. So there's a surprise, in, uh, there's a technical surprise uh, at the end of the novel, which uh, destroys everything and uh, reconstructs it. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah, I'm not going to talk about this because I want to look forward to it. Exactly. Yeah. Just uh, to, to wrap up, I mean, I know you are a very spiritual person, so I, I, I wonder whether writing to you is part of your spiritual journey. Yeah, you know, yes and no. The answer is yes and no. At the beginning, there's an initial spark. Um, this is spiritual, of course. Mm. And this comes before consciousness. It, it comes at the level of subconsciousness. Mm. Uh, but when you, once you put pen to paper and you start <coughs> writing, uh, no, it's not spiritual. Although... You can describe uh, it as probably therapeutic. Do you find it therapeutic like yeah. when you cry? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. So uh, you start with a spiritual, uh, I'm talking about myself, I don't know anything about yeah. other writers. For me, it starts with an initial spark. Uh, the idea comes to me uh, from unknown sources. I don't know how, I don't know from where, I don't know anything. Just comes to me, comes to my mind. Uh, most of the times with everything, with every important thing. With names even of the names of the characters, of the characters uh, protagonist, protagonist. Uh, the main theme, uh, the main events which are going to influence the movement of the plot and uh, everything. So they come to me, and this is at the subconscious uh, level, uh, they come as spiritual stuff. And then uh, consciousness starts to, to take role. Uh, but at the same time, this doesn't mean that spirituality disappears. Because every now and then, it just pops out and guide me in one way or another. But at this time, I am... Uh, uh, I am um, aware of this, and, and it becomes in control and becomes under my control. With uh, inspiration and spirituality, they all come under my control. But at the beginning, of course, it's not under my control. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yes. Do we have more time, or do we have we to have wrap to go. up? So we have <laughs> the boat is waiting. The boat is waiting. Okay. okay. Well, please join me thanking uh, Salma. <laughs>
sea stories in medieval Islam are relatively under studied area compared to the past array of more literary Arabic works of different genre. They are written in a simple vernacular style and would appear at various glance to have little to offer beyond entertainment value. However, a closer look to them at them can yield insights into the maritime culture and see lore of the early medieval Islam in the Mediterranean. Sorry, in the Indian Ocean. And the sharing of such sea lore with neighboring cultures and civilizations and the wider world. When I conducted field work in the Arabian Gulf and Oman several years ago, I connected a number of personal <coughs> stories from mariners, paradivers, and fishermen. Admittedly, although much of what was recounted had an element of truth based on experience and skills, there was also an element of exaggeration of embellishment in the narratives. Some of these, some of their stories, in part or in whole, are included in my book, Seafaring in the Arabian Gulf and Oman, People in the Gulf. The whole idea was to capture the voices of mariners in their different activities, in their experience out at sea. There were in the stories sea creatures never seen before. Pirates that jumped on board and threatened to kill the crew. Gales and storms witnessing the abyss of the ocean. And jinn, evil spirits which guided the ship to destruction. Such stories I found later have a parallel to those related by travelers of the early modern, modern and medieval periods. Remarkably, there is a collection of some stories called The Marvels of India, which was written in the 10th century. In this unique collection of six stories that I'm going to talk about, Today, and although the title contains the name India, the stories are not about India, but perhaps reflect the centrality in the ocean, in the Indian Ocean. India brings maritime communities of the Indian Ocean together as the cargo pilgrim ships drop or weigh anchor at various ports. I would like to begin with a few words about the medieval works of maritime culture before coming to this uh, marvelous of India, its authorship and provenance, and the process. <coughs> a description will follow on the landscape and seascape of the region, where the stories were collected, and where this, what the stories entailed. <coughs> one of the stories narrated by is one by the ship uh, owner al -Bakhi. I will end with a discussion, reflections on the genre of sea stories and the unique collection of the marvelous stories in the Arabic literature. Early maritime works were written to offer information on sea trade routes, navigation, description of landscape and seascape, imported and exported goods, as well as commenting on the customs and traditions of the coastal peoples. The early maritime works, Akbar al Hind Wasim, News on India and China, Silsal al Tarawi, Tawarikh, Chain of Narratives, and Ajah al Hind, Marvels of India. The first two are travel accounts of geographical context, physical and human. 
with information on marital activity in the Indian Ocean. From Basra, Serat, or Sahar, the Red Sea, in Africa, to India and China. The author of the original, Akbar Sin, is not known, but the book was re-edited by a merchant, Abu Zayn as Serafi. The second one, the account of the Silsila, were collected by Sulaiman Tajir, Sulaiman Merchant, both connected to the medieval port of Sirat. For the third one, Raja Ibn the man of the India, has been attributed to Buzur Ibn Shahriyar. But the question is, the question of its origin will come later in this presentation. The significance of these three maritime works is that they are the earliest known examples of the distinctive sub-genre of medieval and literature. All three works were published in the 9th and 10th centuries. The Marvels of India contains 136 sea stories, many of which center on the lives of mariners who ventured into the open sea as far indeed as Sumatra, Java, and China. They are a collection of disparate sea stories with no particular structure of theme connecting them. The particular subgenre of medieval Arabic literature to which these stories belong is called Ajab, a word for marvelous, wonders, curiosities. They are often narrated with a touch of ironic humor and with an element of exaggeration for effect, making them similar in many ways in content and style to the tales of the seven voyages of Sinbad the Sailor in the Arabian Nights, where the listener or reader is lost in wonder at the stories of exploration, treasure hunting, and discovery. In the words of one modern day traveler, every returning ship seemed to bring back fresh ever more bizarre curiosities, and every departure was packed with ever ambitious dreams. To note that the marvels prepared to be factual stories, building on a chain of authorities, are Islam. But their content would suggest otherwise. While the stories of Sinbad are presumed to be fiction. It is entirely probable that they were embroideries of earlier factual accounts. And we stand here at crossroads between cultural history and fiction. These stories may well contain underlying information of use, not to the literature person, but to the historian, even to the archaeologist. So, what do the sea stories of the marvels of India entail? The stories contain <coughs> tales witnessed by mariners, merchants, and travelers, embarking on cargo ships, sailing to distant lands for trade. They recount stories about how they survived storms and shipwrecks, their encounters with the spirits and sea creatures in experiences of marvels and wonders. The stories are about the Indian Ocean, which is divided into the seven seas, which is a classic in a lot of civilizations. The Sea of Zanj, which refers to the African East Africa. The Sea of Lar, the Arabian Sea. The Sea of Harkan, the Bay of Bengal. The Sea of Kalahbar, west coast of Maraya, the Sea of Salahit, Sumatra, the Sea of Kartanj, between the islands of Sumatra and Borneo, 
in the sea of southern China. South. Countries are grouped according to the trade commodities that they were known for. So East Africa, the land of Zanj, known for ivory and slaves. The countries around the southern Arabian Gulf were referred to as the land of incense. India, the land of pepper. Sumatra, Java, Malaya were the land of gold. And Moluccas were known as the spice <coughs> of until some years ago, the marvels were attributed to Buzurk ibn Shahriya of Ram Hormuz. Uh, it's a town in the uh, province of Khuzistan, southwest Iran. It is alleged that he was a sea captain. He lived in Sirah on the Iranian coast. He had, however, no date for his birth, no date for his death. From a few dates in the stories, we can gather that they were collected in the 10th century. But recently, it came to light that the marvelous authorship is actually not Buzo, but one who came from Siraf and lived in Egypt in 1970. His name was Abu Imran Musa ibn Rabat al Aus. Extract of similar stories by Al Ausi were found in a later work in the 14th century by an encyclopedist, Al Oman. So, how did this name, Buzuk, come to be about? According to a study conducted by Jean Charles Dussel, his name was not recorded by Buzuk himself, but was added to an Istanbul manuscript, Hagia Sophia 3300, leading us to understand that Buzuk. Have been apocryphal. Whether real or fictional, both Buzurk and Al Ausi came from or lived in Sirav, which is at the center of the story. Sirav was a prosperous port, as is evident from written medieval Arabic sources, located roughly opposite Bahrain Islands in the Arabian Persian. It was connected diagonally with mainland Shiraz in the 10th century map as it shows in Siraf today lies in the It was the gateway to China. Indeed, all sea routes to and from China connected with the Red Sea in East Africa. Excavations in Siraf show an active port from the Sasanian period to the Black to the fort, palatial residences, mosques, and buildings. The ship Graffito is but a memory of that seafaring past. It is evident from medieval Arabic accounts that the sea route was much preferred to the land route. Most of the maritime trade was transferred to Sirah, Suhar, on the Oman coast. Two geographers of the 10th century, Al Istakhri and Al Maktisi, visited the port city in the second half of the century. Both were impressed by the beauty and its affluent population. The historian of Masoudi describes a number of mariners and merchants from the Indian Ocean gathering in Sirah. This information about maritime activities in Sirah is also mentioned in the Marvels of India. In terms of wealth, 
Tzedah was the rival of Basra, you can imagine in those, in those years, connected to Bagdad. Its size and its splendor are Istakhim and famous. Nearly equal to Shiraz, Wahidiyah to Qarib Shiraz. And Al Magdisi could not help but comment on the charm of this city. I have not seen in the realm of Islam more remarkable buildings than those of Siraz. Mara Aitu in Islam The heyday of Siraz was during the early decades of the Buddha dynasty in the 11th century. There was a decline in the population. Maritime people left Siraz, went to Sohar went to Aden, went to Jeddah, went to West Indian coast. Trade declined, and it was not clear as to what brought the end of Siraf, whether it was precipitated by an earthquake, natural disaster. But its fame was echoed of many centuries later until this very day. Sirafi mar mariners are described by the geographer Sahi as men who passed their whole lifetime on the ship. Al Masudi met many of these Sirafi skippers on voyages to West India, East Africa, and China. He says that they were the most knowledgeable and experienced of long distant voyagers. Although he does not comment about their lives or achievements, it is understood that they were skippers of some fame. Otherwise, he would have not mentioned them. And the number of stories about Serafi mariners found in the marvels of India exemplifies <coughs> the heroism these people had shown in braving the seas of Arabia and China. The Marvel's sea stories are eyewitness accounts of what the historians and geographers have reported on Ziraf, Costumes and its families. They captured their lives at sea, crystallizing that moment in time. Ziraf and its mariners may have disappeared, but the story. The marvels of India, like the Sinbad stories, were collected with an aim to entertain, but also to instruct, as many, many were narrated to the purpose, <coughs> connecting events and people. Often, fortune turns to misfortune, but ending with a moral. There is a pattern of marvel and mystery Long distant journeys, storms and gales, fire and volcano eruptions and shipwrecks, search for gold, ivory and precious stones, encounter with the unexpected, besieging monsters and giants. What captivated the audience was hearing about magic experiencing the unknown, and escaping to a different world, always with the reassuring expectation that the main character would return back to normality. One such story was that of the sea captain Abhara. Abhara, an extraordinary man who progressed from shepherd in the desert to fisherman. Then he became a sailor. Then he became a skipper, sailing from Siraf to India and China. <coughs> Abhara's story was meant to be an example of one sea captain with much sailing experience and foresight. He sailed to China seven times, prompting the narrator to comment only adventurous men had made this voyage before. 
no one had done it without an accident. Even a man with a child, you know, lying on the way, it was already a miracle. Returning safe and sound was unheard of. I have never heard tell of anyone except him, Abhara, who had made the two voyages there and back without disaster. The storyteller is making an important point. The journey to China was not without hazard, and often disaster befell the voyagers, whether from the forces of nature, or human aggression, or weakness. Here is a story retold by a ship owner Abu Zahr al about a fellow shipmaster, the passengers and crew, who experienced just such a disaster on their way to China. The calamity was purely human in origin, and this is what happened. The storyteller engages his listeners <coughs> by telling them that Al Bakhri was truly a man of integrity, worthy of respect. He was indeed a man that everyone took heed to. And every man took heed to, to what he said, and therefore the story is worth telling and worth believing. The story is about the island of women. Intrigued the audience The ship carried a number of merchants of diverse ethnic, religious, and linguistic backgrounds, who, in the course of their voyage from Siraf to China, faced the violence of the gale in a sea that boiled, beaten about by frightening waves. On a ship that leapt and plunged, and shuddered and trembled. Each merchant in fear prayed according to his religion for surrendering themselves to God. When I read that, looking at the audience, he tells them that the ship was about to founder, not because of the waves and winds, let me tell you, but because the negligence of the crew and the state of the rigging The narrator here pauses as the silent audience wait in suspense. Then on the third day, the passengers and crew experienced an even more frightening sight. The ship was approaching a fire that spread over the whole horizon. They preferred to die rather than to witness the suffering of each one of them. <clears throat> Once more, the audience fell in silence until the narrator continued with the story. There was on board the ship an old man of Kadith from Islamic Spain who was hiding all through the voyage from Tehran to China. He was being fed by a sailor, but actually this sailor believed that a guardian angel was eating the food and drinking the water, and was not aware of the man in hiding. He believed that by feeding the angel, the ship would be protected against disaster. When the old man of Kadit saw the danger of the ship and the state of fear of all those concerned, he came out from the hiding. Some sailors saw the man and they were bewildered and were shaken by how he appeared from nowhere. He was taken to the captain. After some time arguing about how and what, the old man silenced everyone. 
and reassure them that there was nothing to worry about. Because by the grace of God, you will be saved. What you see is an island bordered and encircled by mountains on which the ocean waves hurl themselves. During the night, this produces the effect of an enormous fire, which frightens me. Sunlight, this illusion is a He reassured them, fear not, all men are saved. This brought joy to the passengers and crew. In the following days, when they all, when all was calm, they approached the island. They all disembarked and threw themselves on the sand and rolled in the light on the ground. But the tragedy was yet to unfold. This island was inhabited by ferocious women who fell upon each one of the crew and passengers and used them for their pleasure. Sadly, all the men died of exhaustion, one after the other. The old man of Cadiz, however, was taken away by one woman and treated kindly. And together they escaped on the ship's boat and reached the port where the ship had come. She became a Muslim, gave him several children, and they lived. There are four parts in this story. The first is presenting facts about the narrator, al barqati the ship owner. He was an agent converted to Islam. We are also given details about the ship sailing to China, its merchants, the different backgrounds, the crew, and their nautical skills. The second feature is the embellishment of the story with marvelous curiosities and surprises, such as the falling sea, the fire blazing in the horizon island of women, the tragic death of the passengers and crew. Thirdly, the hero of the story. The man of God. And fourthly, the mother. The only one to survive the catastrophe was the old man, who seems to have had divine guidance that the ship will not be lost in spite of the incompetent crew who did not handle the rigging properly. Why both crew and passengers allow themselves to be overcome by the sexually ferocious women, leaving the men of Cadiz and his Muslim converted wife to sail off into the sunset. This, this story is gone, and I will not go into the details, but we can gather what is it that we can gather from this tale is the first. The actual information navigating the route to San to, to China. The hazards of the Malay seas, the nautical skills of the of the skipper, the boatswain, and so on, and the sails and the rigging. A skipper was guided by stars. Al Barhati, Al Barhati's fellow shipman speaks of this canopies. We are at the wind of the wind and the waves, he says. Worst of all, there is that fire we are running towards, and that already fills the horizon. We would rather, we would rather be drowned than burn. The stars guide the navigators, and they still do up to this very day, especially the people in interviews in the Red Sea. And they warn voyagers of climatic change. They warn voyagers of storms and games. Some are believed to be symbolic of something to happen on this canopus. Certainly in this story, the canopus signified abandon all hope of return. But the fact <coughs> is a trust in the man of Kadir. Another factual information is that the skipper takes an oath not to expose a ship to loss. 
for us captains when we board the ship stake our lives and destiny on it. If the ship is safe, we remain alive. If it is not, we die. The code of practice, which is one of the twelve principles of navigation recorded by Second, we have the human interaction with nature and culture. Fear. The state of fear the people experience by the violence of the game and the approaching dread in fire, the superstition of the danger of the danger protecting the ship from destruction, and the danger that it will happen. So it was a real thing. The Zoroastrian worship of fire. Praying together according to one's religion. There was a Muslim, Buddhist, <coughs> the men becoming tools of the women's pleasure, and the old man and the young boy. The sea stories in the marvels of India are the earliest examples of the southern <laughs> <laughs> and very found in medieval Arabic literature. They are unique in that no conventional sea story, with the exception of the seven voyages of Sindhu the Sailor, has appeared since. But it is important to note that the Sindhu voyages are only a part of the whole life, which is largely unrelated to the sea. Although the marvels of India stories fall within the agile theme of wonders and marvels, they offer a wealth of information on diverse subjects that are both instructive and entertaining, touching on the human element of life by and at sea, with a moral plot at the end of some story. The marvels are written in Arabic, representing a diversity of ethnic and religious and linguistic communities in the notion. Their background may contain facts about the port cities, seals, trade goods, and they often demonstrate a commonality of practices in seafaring navigation throughout the Indian Ocean. These stories have obviously developed from the oral culture which would have been recounted again and again. They bond communities together about events that they share. They came to be written down as a way of solidifying the past, enabling the stories to live the rest of the world. We find parallel themes of these sea stories in the Sanskrit and Persian tradition, and indeed in the West. There is a striking similarity between the story of the island of women in the marvels of India and Homer's, Homer's Odyssey, where the women play the roles of seductresses, such as the goddess Circe, who lived in the island of Aea, and the goddess Calypso on the island of Ogygia, who both seduced Odysseus away from his return to his home and in the marvels of India, the theme of the island of women is taken to a more darker, <coughs> extreme, and fatal consequences for the mariners. The apocryphal acts of Andrew in the Christian Bible tradition portray scenes of shipwrecks, pirates, and cannibals. Such stories were known in the early Christians by the early Christians of Africa, Egypt, Syria, and Asia Minor and other uh, places. They run parallel to sea stories of the Arabian, Persian, and Indian cultures. And although it may be argued that they have influenced each other, it could be that they have risen independently of each other. The Ajahid literature is a genre which pervades in early and medieval times. It is important to note that the 
Quran is one of God's marvels. And the extraordinary things was the signs of God's creative power. The marvel of God's creation was then a pious act. The marvel stories are written in mixed literary and vernacular style of Arabic thus breaking away from the canon of a good Arabic literary style, which was the norm for any Arabic literary work of Britain. The Marvels and the Arabian Nights stories follow this big style, and there is even another collection of stories from Ajayi, Tales of the Marvels. Such stories were memorized and then narrated to the common people in markets, khans, and places of rest. In doing so, the storyteller may have felt freer to improvise rather than stick to the flexible, <coughs> inflexible written story. The mixed style of this story is thus a reflection of the oral origin. But the oral culture is dynamic, a written record of this culture connects. Men of literature, historians, geographers, travelers have given us a few scattered examples of maritime stories. And there are hints that there may have been more, many more, but sadly they are lost according to the man of India, which makes the marbles of India such a joy, such a joy not only to be enjoyed for their narratives, to enjoy by us, but also for the researcher looking for nuggets of information on the social cultural history of the town. They are indeed a unique source. <coughs> my dear audience, thank you for listening to me. It's like he's written the wonders himself. Yes. The fiction, the, 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 the interplay between fictionality and fact, and the bringing back of the curiosity from other parts of the world. I think he's acting And acting on and also, and also, in fact, telling the story to us. The performer. Very nice. Uh, Mm -hmm. Any comments? Any other comments? Mm -hmm. Beyond this, what can we say? <laughs> Very hard, yes. Well, uh, this is a comment from India. In regard to the table account uh, of uh, designated as the Ajayi building, of course, it would have a, a legacy of such taxes of the Sharia, and even before the Al Layla Wa Layla, which was basically based on Hazar Khan, and again, that was based on such, so many things from. India in the context of Hajjadi and Sarai. Two things are very striking. Uh, in terms of the accounts that uh, could be related geographically to the Indian coast, have there been some efforts in this regard so that it's not simply the fiction, rather it is related to the fact. Number one. Number two, what have been the possible uh, relationships between uh, the accounts in Hajjadi with those that we find in the al Plata or Leda, especially in the Indian context. Yes, that is true. Except the two, two main points, physical. Um, yes, the names uh, of ports uh, are factual, um, but not only India, by the way. This is why what, what's interesting that it's, it, we have Southeast Asia and up to even China. Um, and the, of course, the, the, the commonality with the Arabian Nights, which mentions a number of Islands and, and uh, ports. And, uh, <coughs> yes. and a lot of it of this tradition is, of course, Sanskrit and Persian, and then uh, uh, came down to Arabic. Um, 
later because when his health became a little more drunken. But thank you. Thank you. In literary texts of the ancient times of seafaring, there's very much about Omina. And uh, you could have known better if you have. Uh, uh, um, if you have seen this sign, or if you have, have taken this sign into consideration, is this uh, of any importance to these texts as well? So by starting the cruise, there's some li uh, light signal which uh, say, which might sign to the later development that there is a, a catastrophe ahead or something like this. Or are they utterly surprised? So okay, yeah. uh, that's an interesting. Uh, yeah. I, 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 I'm not aware of this. Yeah, yeah. talking about other stories. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but it's very important in the, uh, ancient times. Uh, you could have known this because omina are even today of great importance. You, uh, on which side to spit, on which side to stand, etc., is of great importance to seafaring up to today. So. Uh, how did they wa want to prepare for the travel by some uh, uh, some uh, gestures, uh, habits, or something they met to uh, made to to secure uh, secure travel? Yeah. Are we, are we talking fact factually? No, no, no. Yeah, uh, uh, it's but the they're sure factual. telling the story. Uh, yeah. the, the customs are factual, but uh, the literary text make uh, make something out of it as, as well, which is purely fictional. So yeah. there is a crow coming yeah. uh, coming from from heavens or something. He's flying from le uh, right to left. Yeah, everybody knows that you don't have to get, get on a journey I, when there's a crow flying. Or something I, I get, like I get that. No, as far as I know. From the stories that I have read, and I've read them a few times, uh, yeah. went through that. This element of surprise is much more common. Okay. Than, but that, that's a good yeah. answer. Thanks. Yeah, I was wondering. Uh, you mentioned from the text the very incidents that happened during the travel on sea. Mm -hmm. sea. But uh, I mean, that kind has been occupied by the, the existence of the sea travel itself. The, you say to be on a ship. And you mentioned the Quran also. And there are Quranic references between the two types of traveling travel by land, travel by sea. Yes. Is there anything in the text that you read that des describes the particularity of the travel by sea in this kind of uh, general way? Specifically in the stories? To some extent, yes. Yes. I mean, um, as opposed to traveling by land. Uh, well, they, they, well, well, all the stories are. At the <coughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean the, the, the travel at, at sea or travel by sea as such has been a symbol for a, a way of being, a way of living. Of living, yeah. Uh, yes, yes, it's mentioned uh, by not not in the Ajari, mm -hmm. but by historians or geographers like Al Istakhri. So you, you with all your experience, what would you say is the particularity of travel by sea? Um, is it virtuous? <laughs> um, in what sense? Uh, my experience, in other words, you know. The, and the, if you take the ship as a symbol of a way of going through life, <laughs> as a voyage, a particular type of voyage, uh, so how would you? Distinguish that from travel by land, or what is the particularity of it? Um, we're not talking philosophically over here. We're talking factually. <laughs> because I, I have to be careful not to not the, question, the question is coming from a philosopher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 because I mean, uh, there's something. Um, there were many advantages by traveling by sea, mm -hmm. as opposed to by land. Mm -hmm. Uh, sea was shorter. The distance were shorter, shorter. By land, you had problems. You know, you know you had problems of, of heat, um, problems of, of marauding, uh, bad winds, um, uh, length, you know, distance. While the sea worked with the monsoonal winds, so which worked uh, in a six-month cycle. So there were many benefits. Um, it doesn't mean that they were not um, hazardous. They were. 
as you have seen from the story. Yeah, but there's something, there's something there, but I, uh, 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 it, this is quite interesting because uh, from an interior perspective, mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, the other way around. The land is more safe and you can go from city to city and everything is fine. When you're on the sea, you are highly dependent on the gods. And if, if they want you to die, you die, but, but you can't do anything uh, on your own, if the gods want you to die, yeah. it's that way. So it's completely the other way around. The, the way by land was uh, well, regarded as the same I, way. I think you'll be surprised to, to know yeah. that going by land, they were worried. Mm -hmm. they, 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 it wasn't safe. And, and, and neither way was safe. Neither way. But, 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 uh, the, but, um, uh, there was a feeling that you could do more on your own when you were by land. You, can, you, you, could, prepare, you, you could prepare for thieves or robbers or anything like this yeah. by taking men into uh, account or, or getting extra guards. But on sea, when a storm comes, what can you do? Yeah. You, you are completely, uh, you are completely yeah. lost. Yeah. So yeah. this yeah. is the difference. Uh, yes, yes. yes. Very true. Uh, I think that uh, the most important aspect of this type of stories is the invention of danger. It's more inventing danger than danger itself. <coughs> and then this is for the sake of creating the hero, which you said by the end. I mean, you, you provided us with several aspects. And it looks like uh, the colonial uh, adventure stories also uh, built later on in the 19th century. I'm speaking, for example, about uh, English. Uh, the English yarn later on, built a lot on this uh, aspect of inventing danger. So it can be the, if it's not the weather, then it is uh, women. It's mainly women. Women are also a major source of danger. Mm. As uh, you, it's always this uh, engulfing woman uh, type of. Uh, uh, I mean, woman dentata. Okay, mm. which engulfs enticing women, which should be subdued, and mm. uh, I mean, this is what happens in like yeah. the story. I mean, it's a very, very interesting perspective. I don't, I don't, uh, how do you say, I don't subscribe to it hundred percent, mm. but there is some element of it. Uh, so I agree with you. Um, but the, 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 the danger, there was danger. Believe me, when you hear the stories, see, I mean, in my book, uh, Seafaring in the Ages, are people that told the stories, you know, uh, especially the pearl divers and so on. The danger was incredible. Yeah. Unexpected, you know, uh, gales, unexpected winds, uh, currents, and shipwrecks. You hear so many times of thundering of, of ships on dogs. So, uh, you were a bit too, too cruel to say that they, <laughs> that they invented. No, but yes, uh, natural dangers are there. I mean, storms and all, we believe for, in that. Don't but forget that there's the element of entertainment. For the sake of narrative. Yeah. come up with some exaggeration. Yeah. Okay. But seamen do exaggerate. Mm. Yes. Yeah, they like that. <laughs> they love it, yeah. Okay. Uh, to what extent is uh, theological thought reflected in these stories? For example, Qadar. Or predestination by God. I mean, you have to shrip, uh, shipwreck because God yeah. predestined it. So is there a notion of theological thought in these stories, or are they only entertainment? Folk, 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 folk theology, if you want to call it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, popular, I know what you mean. popular beliefs. Popular beliefs. Yeah. yeah, I know what you mean. Yes, but yes, mainly popular beliefs. The superstition is very strong. Yeah. yeah. In uh, in Ibn Shizi, we yeah. always have the scene of the storm, and you always like there is a. Uh, uh, famous stories about many Lusak, they call them Nasik, Zahid in the ship, like the, um, and uh, especially there was like, a story about Abraham, like there was a, a, a sage with them in the ship and he started praying in order to save the ship from the storm and the, uh, the seeing of the clouds that they started like to, to, to extend their tongues to move the ship yeah. everywhere. Yeah, wow, wow. So there was an element yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Which one is the the, the al uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's very 
very much for that. Do we have examples in the Asha and of piracy? Um, yes. Uh, the identity of the pirates is clear. It's Where Indian, come in, from? Indian mainly. Indian. Indian, yeah, they were famous. Uh, <laughs> but they, they were authorities. Eh? Which, which side of the coast? Uh, on the West Indian coast, but also up to Socotra, even to the Red Sea. Ah. They are mentioned. Um, and with the decline of um, Sirach, does anything, I mean, maybe this is a historical question, but <coughs> with the decline of Sirach, does another hub appear um, that sort of takes over that? That function because presumably maritime travel did not end yeah. with the decline of Sirach. Mm -hmm. Do we know anything about that? <coughs> you know, these, these sea stories are unique. Up to this very day, there is no collection of sea stories. Well, there is a joke you could do. Among it's many. Among many. <laughs> <laughs> because this has perpetuated the idea that Arabs are not sailors. But clearly, yes. we have a, yes. uh, early yes. evidence of the fact that they are yes. very much. But what, what, what the Ajayev brings out <coughs> mainly is this cosmopolitan nature, yes. Western erosion of India, because Western and Eastern. It's amazing. <laughs> it, it, it describes Islam at the time, you know, that Islam was cosmopolitan. Muslim and non Muslim, often, often living in harmony. That's what I was preaching in Bahrain. They like that. If only we go back to those times when we yes. lived in Harvard. Yes. So unfortunately, the many uh, ethnographical accounts that we find in our Jabali and also the Halifa Zahid of Sirati, they have uh, totally based on the hearsays and uh, you know, yeah. oral. Oral, yeah. some oral traditions of that. Yeah. And they must have been corrected in some foreign studies. Yeah. Just I recollect one example, uh, because I just recollect the text of Abdullah Sirafi. Uh, he mentions about uh, the illicit relationship between men and women in India, and uh, prescribes a particular uh, uh, punishment that is usually carried out, which is actually incorrect. For example, burning is an yes. example. Yes. Such types of traditions have never been part of yeah, yeah. Yeah, this, this is where the historian, yeah. uh, of course, the archaeologists come in. You know, just want to look at Sirach. <coughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. I mean, there is, um, once the questions finish, I'll just tell you about the story of the boy. Okay, according according to the Ajayi. The heading? You know, the usual story, abandoned ship, etc., etc. They went on the ship's boat, small, you know, 12 of them. And there was this fat boy, quite plump, among them. He was what they called the cabin boy. And they were rowing, rowing, and one day, two days rowing to go to an island. And they were all, uh, you know, getting weaker and weaker, you know. Fourth day, they were still rowing. The eyes of the seamen fell on this boy. And this boy was rolling his eyes until suddenly this boy turned his face and he said, Land! Land! <laughs> and it ends there. Right. The whole thing is that they will go to eat yeah, home, but, yes. but <laughs> they don't take it. <laughs> so that's nice and entertaining, but also a little more. Yeah. Well, if there are no more comments, then we can perhaps break for coffee. And I would like to thank very much Dr. Bruce for coming in. Tying together the conversation.